Welcome to Business Watch. Now, last Thursday morning saw the return of dawn raids on eight major insurance companies conducted by the Competition Commission. The Commission said it's reasonable grounds to suspect that the uh, insurers have engaged in collusive practices to fix prices and or trading conditions in respect of fees for investment products such as uh, retirement annuities and premiums for risk-related products. Uh, the products are in the life insurance cover, disability cover, life cover and funeral assistance benefits categories. And it's curious because pricing of individual risk is really based on actuarial tables, similar to mortality tables, but adjusted depending on the insurer's analysis of own experience and expected experience. And this takes actuarial judgment and certainly creates differences. And expense loadings, acquisition costs, termination rates and the like, all of those also contribute to differences. Maybe there is some similarity in policy fees, but, but that, uh, I would imagine, is relatively minor. Certainly what interests me is the mention of investment fees, which technically aren't levied by the officers, but by their subsidiary investment houses. And it's then odd that some of the high-charging fund managers are not even mentioned. Now, tomorrow, legal practitioners, economists, politicians, academics, and industry role players uh, will meet at the 16th Annual Competition Law, Economics and Policy Conference. And they're going to be talking about and reflecting on competition regulation and the state of the economy and various policy proposals that are aimed at shaping an inclusive, growing and deconcentrated economy. It's themed effective competition law enforcement and policy development for sustainable, growing and inclusive markets. And it's obviously an opportune time to reflect on that theme and ask whether our competition law is indeed fit for purpose. Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome our panel to reflect on this question. Heather Irvine is a partner in the corporate department of Bowman's uh, Joburg office and a member of the competition practice. Amorberger Smith is a director of Worksman's Advisory Services and previously worked at the Competition Commission. And Zakele Zaik Tembu is a legal researcher at the Free Market Foundation. Welcome all firstly. Heather, what does effective competition law enforcement and policy development for sustainable, growing and inclusive markets actually look like? Hi, Michael. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I think the Commission sees itself as playing a very central role in keeping South African markets across the economy competitive. So preserving current levels of competition, trying to ensure that new entrants can get into markets. And once they're in that they're able to be sustainable. The Commission has been voicing concerns about a persistent and in some cases rising level of concentration. So we have lots of markets where there are relatively few players um, and they see themselves as taking quite an active role, I think, in being able to allow for smaller firms to get in, black owned businesses to get in. And that, of course, is a key path to growth for the South African economy. We know that small businesses can create lots of jobs. We need to accelerate transformation in our economy. Um, and I think the Commission sees themselves as playing a central role in that. Amor, how do you see the, the competition's role, uh, commission's role, in this central idea of opening up, deconcentrating the South African economy and helping the South African economy transform? I think what we can't deny is the fact that we still have a concentrated economy and in a lot of instances skewed. But what I find interesting, Michael, is that the commission has historically, and especially over the past 12 months, prohibited transactions, which would have introduced higher levels of empowerment and black economic empowerment within the economy. Now, this is a balancing act. And if we look at public interest and the spread of ownership, I think what we are looking for is a, a clearer view as to how the commission actually sees their, view, their, their role and the way forward. There is no doubt that we need to address these issues and that we need to be sensitive towards it. But there are different um, aspects that we need to consider. And the one is actually, how do we empower the um, all individuals within the South African society and all HDP individuals and get it flow through to the lower levels within our country's economy and address employment and employment creation, job opportunity creation through the role of the competition authorities. 
And this is not an easy task for them. What immediately springs to mind is the, uh, the Volta farce on the Burger King transaction last year which was actually uh, all about public interest, or so the commission said, but was actually in effect uh, je um, you know, hampering and, and jeopardizing uh, historically disadvantaged South Africans and, and their investment in Burger King. We're gonna come back to that. Zakes, firstly, uh, on that broad theme, uh, you know, I mean, wh what does effective competition law enforcement and policy look like for you at the Free Market Foundation in, in the context of growing the South African economy and ensuring it's made more inclusive? Uh, I think firstly what we have to consider is the, the, the causes of the concentration in the South African economy, right? Previously we had a state that was quite interventionist in the economy that passed a lot of regulations that protected certain industries, that barred certain players from, you know, entering certain industries. So once we understand the cause of concentration, it then helps us look at the context under which the Competition Commission currently and, you know, general competition policy has been implemented because it seems like there's a disconnect amongst, at the very least, policymakers in that they operate under the limited pie fallacy. And I heard my fellow panelists too, at the very least, seemingly tacitly acknowledging this, that for transformation to happen, there somehow needs to be positive action from the Competition Commission in the sense of mandating maybe companies to act a particular way. You mentioned the Burger King deal, maybe imposing conditions on mergers or things like that, whereas the other end of the spectrum, at least what we, how we look at it at the Free Market Foundation, is the economy is not a, a, a limited pie, a fixed pie, to say that, in the sense that the, 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 the reason for concentration was because there were certain barriers, legislative barriers, you know, barriers premised on the use of force, legislative force, that were put in place that excluded certain people from you know, participating in the economy. And we think that the most effective way to you know, achieve the objective of the Competition Commission and competition policy in general is would be removing those legislative barriers rather than in as what happens most cases than not when the Competition Commission acts, imposing more regulations really on businesses and private enterprise. So really how we look at what the Competition Commission should be doing is actually trying to address the reasons why there was con concentrations in our economy, which really can only be pointed squarely at the feet of the state in imposing regulations on said economy, which barred certain people from participating fully. So we think that, you know, that is how we should, at the very least, look at competition yep. policy and Th how, you know. Mm. Th thank you, Zakes. And I, I mean, we'll come also to the way competition policy is applied to state-owned enterprises, where I think the Competition Commission has been relatively reluctant to uh, prosecute clear uh, monopoly practices in the South African economy. But I want to come back uh, either to this issue of public interest in competition law, which hasn't gone away. It hasn't di died down. And it, it lends itself to increased criticism around the uncertainty that it creates, because it does seem like that there, there isn't a strict guideline here of what public interest measures, uh, particularly the Commission and Trade and Industry and Competition Minister Ibrahim Patel want to s extract from merging parties. And that creates all kinds of uncertainty when you're trying to put a deal forward and, and uh, model the economic uh, merits of that transaction. Um, how are you seeing this applied from your vantage point, this public interest concern in these criteria? Well, we've definitely seen an expansion of the kinds of conditions which are typically being required. Um, we're seeing a lot more local procurement conditions being imposed. Uh, for example, in a transaction where MTN sold off their tower base, the buyer IHS was required to commit to source products and services inside South Africa, not to import them. Uh, that kind of localization condition never really used to be a, a feature of our public interest landscape, and it has increasingly become so. It seems like uh, the merger control process is being used as a way to enforce and shore up the various different sector plans that have been developed by the ministry. Um, and this creates a, a lot of uncertainty for merging parties and specifically, Michael, for foreign direct investment. I think it's become a significant factor in foreign parties' decisions about whether to invest in South Africa or not. Uh, they perceive that they will be presented with a, a laundry list of demands. They will have to set up funds. They will have to commit to regulate how they contract with parties once they're inside South Africa. 
they may have to also agree to implement a worker trust and to set aside some of their shares for that purpose. Um, so this all adds to the transaction cost. And importantly, it makes it very bit difficult to predict how long it's going to take to get a clearance and, and even on what terms that clearance is going to be possible to obtain. So I, I think this is a real drag on deal making. And we, we've indicated to the Commission on a number of occasions that we think uh, we need a sensible guideline. Mm. And it's something which really ought to be negotiated between government, business and the Commission uh, in a sensible way mm. and including other stakeholders like Labour. Because until we've got clarity about how these conditions are applied, it becomes very, very difficult to, to deal with deals in an efficient way. And of course, all of this in an environment where you have the president begging for foreign direct investment and doing everything he can to try and stimulate our, our status as a hub for investment on the African continent. Um, so the, the, it doesn't seem like there's a consistent policy being applied here. And there really needs to be if we want to succeed in that mission to attract investment to South Africa. And also given what a CEO could likely commit to in an environment that is so uncertain and so ever-changing and more to be able to commit to local sourcing or procurement, as a CEO I could probably provide you with a good faith letter, but to commit to something in writing for three years, market conditions change, you see uh, another geopolitical event con constraining supply chains of a key input, it's just very difficult to commit to these kinds of local procurement targets, for example, in an environment that is so uncertain. What do you see as the main concerns currently with the way this uh, public interest criteria and, and conditions are being applied? Michael, if we just think about local procurement, I would like to suggest that we've seen a change in the ministry and Minister Patel's approach to local procurement, where in certain instances he's actually moved away in his view from local procurement and the enforcement of that. So, you know, there is this uncertainty, would it be required or won't it be required? If we consider the role of the competition authorities, we need to remind ourselves and the competition authority that at the end of the day, they are regulator and they are there to enforce the legislation. Now, we do not want them to actually create law in itself in the way in enforcing guidelines and putting guidelines forward and their exact view. We need to understand how they, through their guidelines that they might issue, will give effect to what our parliamentarians actually legislated. And herein lies the uncertainty if we look at um, the public interest aspect. You know, we look at various aspects from a public interest perspective and the these elements of public interest must be balanced. And currently, it would seem that there is an overemphasis on certain aspects. Historically, it used to be employment. Everyone used to focus on employment only. Now, it seems to we, that everyone is focusing very heavily on ownership as the number one public interest aspect. And we need to think as if we consider broad-based empowerment and the empowerment of societies, how this will impact the role and the function of public interest and the impact of the competition authorities in exercising their duties as a regulator and not emphasize one specific aspect. You know, if I look at um, the, the arguments around and especially with from the free market um, uh, um, perspective, we almost back at a point where we were 25 years back, where we argued the Borg School of Economics that governments shouldn't involve themselves in regulation at all, versus the Chicago School of Economics, where we think there's an absolute need for government intervention and regulation. And somehow in the middle, we need to find ourselves, because at mm. the end of the day, it is so important to create employment for effective competition regulation to be applied and for certainty in the competition law regime, especially yeah. if we look at foreign direct investment. And, and exactly who is doing the cost benefit analysis is, yeah, here? Because I, I can certainly argue quite uh, convincingly for 
a competition enforcement in certain markets. If you think of digital, for example, the business model does tend to lend itself towards uh, monopoly outcomes. Uh, first mover advantage uh, and just the platform and network effect model do tend to lead to that. So you do need some kind of intervention. But Zakes, and I'm going to throw it back to you, you know, obviously from the FMF perspective, you're going to say light touch. Uh, my question is obviously whether or not deterring investment is in the public interest, because Unfortunately, what the uncertainty is doing, while we understand we need to transform the economy and open it up for small entrants, this uncertainty is deterring foreign direct investment. And certainly that's not in the public interest. So how is that being balanced here, if at all? Uh, and, and I think you, you, you touched on a pretty important aspect of this in the inherent arbitrariness of competition legislation, really, is that we can sit here and argue, right, and rightfully so, that you know, employment is in the public interest. Having capital inflows into a country is, a, is in the public interest. Having investment is in the public interest. I mean, the mere fulfillment of deals really would we can argue, we can make these arguments. But the other end of it is that the commission or anyone who would be opposed to us can very can still take the very same public interest and argue and use it to argue against our position and show us how you know when we don't consider ownership and all of these things, it cannot be construed within that. So I think that I agree with the panelists in saying that it creates uncertainty, but I think it is an uncertainty that is baked in into our competition legislation. Because if we were to look at the objectives that are laid out in terms like that, that, that need to be achieved in terms of our competition policy as laid out in the Competition Act, there are, there are multiples of them, right? And the benefits of other, or I heard, I heard, I think I'm more mentioning the box school, the benefits of, of, of jurisdictions like the US is that you have, you know, uh, academics like Borg who, who committed a lot of their times to try and pretty much distill and harmonize all these objectives that are com that, that, that are located in antitrust policy in the US and pretty much argue for maybe consumer preference or consumer well-being, right? And in South Africa, we don't have something to that effect that will seemingly be a grand norm that will direct competition policy and then be a frame of reference for, for instance, people who conduct deals in the legal field or potential investors to use then to gauge whether a potential deal will be approved or not. But we don't have that currently because our legislation simply does not allow for that, really. Mm -hmm. So then it, it opens room for this inconsistency for this inconsistency to arise. And you know, from the free market perspective, really, is that our our argument, of course, would be, you know, competition legislation in its entirety is it lends itself to this arbitrariness and this arbitrariness is compounded when we don't have a grand norm that competition policy seeks to achieve. Mm -hmm. So I think if we, I were to make a, a point above anything else is that I think we need to discuss what competition policy in South Africa seeks to achieve as a grand norm outside of all these mm -hmm other you know mm. ancillary norms that all these other ancillary ancillary norms can be gauged against pretty much to have for instance like they do in the u.s consumer well-being or consumer you know or consumer satisfaction as the general objective that mm. uh, competition yeah. policy seeks to achieve mm. and then that will help i think with the problems of uh mm. Uh, arbitrariness, which then lend itself to inconsistency. Well, on, on that point, I think one, one can quite safely say that uh, if you're going to use the consumer test uh, you know, for concentration, for example, certain markets may be highly concentrated, but the economies of scale are then passed off as a benefit to the end consumer. So I understand what you're saying there. Heather, I just want to move on to the issue of what, what the regulatory role is here of the Competition Commission. When you've got other regulators in the economy, and particularly looking at what happened with the raid on the insurance companies, we, it's a highly regulated industry, finance. You know, we've got the Reserve Bank, the Prudential Authority, the FECA. Is there a potential regulatory overreach here by the Commission now uh, in going into these sorts of areas? And again, does this just further muddy the waters around uh, providing certainty for businesses in which to operate? Well, Michael, the Competition Act is clear that it applies to all sectors of the South African economy, all economic activity in South Africa, which has an effect, unless it's explicitly excluded by other legislation. Um, so in, you know, in the power context, for example, we have MRSA, it has a particular statutory remit around pricing, and, and therefore ESCOM is the sole generator and, and can price as permitted to do so by that regulator that's carved out of the Commission's uh, realm of activity. 
The, the same is not true in relation to insurance, although it is a highly regulated sector. Insurance companies and, and indeed all of the people in the insurance value chain are still subject to the jurisdiction of the commission. And it plays a key role in, in making sure that competitors don't fix prices and uh, dominant firms don't abuse their dominance. Um, so the, the commission has got the right to exercise all of the powers that it has under the Competition Act. Um, but of course, it, it must do so in a way that is uh, in line with what the Competition Act says in terms of something like a search and seizure. And, and there are certainly questions to be asked um, what this means, for example, for the Prudential Authority uh, and what it means for the stability of our financial sector. But, but that's a facet of what the legislature has intended, which is that the Competition Act does mm. apply to these highly regulated sectors. Mm. And uh, I will, it's interesting uh, to see whether or not uh, the Competition Authority has actually approached those other regulators for information that they, they sought to find through the, the Dawn Raids. Uh, are, more, are, are Dawn Raids back as a feature now? Is this something that companies need to prepare and expect more of uh, following what happened last week? Yeah, it's an interesting moment in our competition world, isn't it, Michael? Because for so long we haven't heard about dawn raids, and this is almost like the swan song of the current commissioner um, stepping down um, uh, now, and the last moment we see this massive dawn raid that's attracted so much attention. I think what it highlights is the fact that you can't hide be behind another regulator um, to escape the reach of the Competition Act. And indeed, no matter what, companies must be prepared for a dawn raid um, in all aspects and realize what their duties and responsibilities are and what the powers of the competition authorities are during such a raid. And you know, it's not only the competition authorities that with the powers to raid organizations and companies. They are various regulators and we see it as regulatory lawyers. Um, you know, even the information regulator from a Papia perspective has got the ability to conduct a dawn raid. So companies must be prepared to deal with these aspects and um, have the necessary procedures in place. And I do think um, this is an amazing moment if we look at competition authorities, how they build their presence and create awareness of their existence in an economy. Um, something like a dawn raid makes everyone sit up and take notice of their presence and their um, ability to influence uh, mm -hmm. where we're moving as a business society in South Africa. And you, you, you mentioned a very good point. Obviously, uh, Tim and Corsi Bonakele is the uh, outgoing competition commissioner. Heather, at this time, we've got three or so minutes to go. Uh, when you reflect on the tenure of the competition commission, it is at least one of the better functioning state-owned entities. And he did admit to the FM, and I want to quote here, when uh, broached about the need to investigate public companies, state-owned companies, quite clearly we could have done better in advocating for more competition among state-owned entities. Maybe we gave too much space and respect to the policymakers, given that SOEs are supposed to act in the national interest, and, and they haven't. So we hope that the new commissioner maybe takes up the cudgels there. But overall, uh, his performance, and uh, what sort of state does he leave the commission in? Um, Michael, I think he's done an amazing job uh, to shepherd the commission through uh, an unprecedented time in, in the world, really. Um, you know, the, the commission has been nimble. They have adjusted their priorities to deal with the reality of what South Africa has faced as an economy uh, during the COVID period. Uh, I think we're now sort of coming back to a more normal uh, economy. You can see the commission through the dawn raid, perhaps starting to focus on kind of more conventional cartel type cases. So I think, I think he's done well. He's built an incredible team, both of lawyers and economists. Uh, South Africa is a very complex place. There are lots of different priorities and demands. The Commission has finite resources. Uh, and I, I think given those challenges, uh, they have done well. Um, they've had to negotiate the amendments to the Competition Act, which, of course, we are still feeling our way around. It's exactly the same for the Commission and their team. They, they have to take a view on what the Act means and what it requires them to do. And I, I think they've been quite open and transparent about how they do that uh, and how they go about their work. Uh, they're always willing to engage with the profession and, and with the press. 
Um, so I think look, those are all positives that we hope that um, mm. his successor will carry on with going forward. Yeah, that transparency and accountability I've certainly found is a, a hallmark. We hope Doris Tepe, the former MD of uh, uh, Cheadle Thompson, actually, uh, who's taken over, uh, taking over and picking up the bet on keeps that uh, aspect of the commission uh, going as uh, we head into this new era of competition law. That's where we're going to have to leave it. That was Heather Irvine, a partner in the corporate department of Bowman's Johannesburg office and a member of the competition practice who was joined around the table by Morberger Smith, director at Worksman's Advisory Services, who previously worked at the Competition Commission, and Zake Tembu, a legal researcher at the Free Market Foundation, uh, with the big question on whether or not deterring investment is in the public interest. You're watching Business Watch on Business Day TV.